they might be slow to move and slow to reproduce and slow when eating, but they are quickly endearing to our minds and hearts. Sloths are fascinating creatures with unique habits and characteristics among mammals. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Explore.org is pleased to partner with the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica for Sloth TV. Toucan Rescue Ranch focuses on the care, rehab, and release of Costa Rican wildlife. On Explore.org, we have the opportunity to watch their care of sloths. To discuss the natural history, rescue, rehab, and release of wild sloths, I'm joined by Leslie Howell and Daniel Quintanilla Mendoza. Leslie is the founder and executive director of Toucan Rescue Ranch, and Daniel is their education coordinator. Leslie and Daniel, thanks so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. If you do have questions uh, for Leslie and Daniel about sloths and the work that they do at Toucan Rescue Ranch, drop those in the comments. And a helpful moderator from Explore.org will send a few of those in my direction. We'll try to answer. We'll try to answer at least a few uh, towards the end of the broadcast, or maybe during the broadcast. But I do have a ton of questions about sloths and about uh, the work at the Toucan Rescue Ranch for Leslie and Daniel. So we might as well just get right at it. Uh, but uh, maybe the the first question I should um, I should ask is just a little bit about the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the the ranch and its mission? Yeah, you, sure. So yeah, so Toucan Rescue Ranch, we are a nonprofit organization. We are a rescue center. Uh, we're not a zoo, and our main focus is to rescue, re rehabilitate, and rewild the animals back to their natural habitats. Between 50 to 80% of all the animals that were received are released or rewilded, better said. And um, it's thanks to the support of many, many, many people and we can keep doing what we're doing. Um, the other percentage are permanent residents that they cannot be rewilded for different reasons. For example, uh, they were pets or in some cases they suffer from severe injuries, therefore they cannot be rewilded. Um, but yeah, when and those animals, the ones that can't be rewilded, we try to give them the best life that we possibly can. And I'm sure that can be quite a challenge to get animals back to a place where they can, uh, you know, be released into the into the wild once again. And we'll, I think, talk more specifically about that work towards the end of the broadcast. But uh, I also want to learn more about sort of like the biology of sloths. Um, you know, I, I live in North America. There are no wild sloths in North America. Our giant ground sloths went extinct many thousands of years ago. Uh, so let's just talk about the basics of, of sloth biology. How many species of sloths are there in Costa Rica, for example? And what are their preferred habitats? So um, in Costa Rica, we have two species of sloths. We have the two-toed and the three-toed sloths. Although we like to call them two-fingered and three-fingered. Uh, we're going to talk about that later. Um, and usually their main habitat is um, the rainforest. We do have a uh, dry forest in Costa Rica that is in the North Pacific, but it's quite ex strange to see them in there. And what about uh, their, the way they sense the world? How good is a, a sloth senses, uh, particularly like uh, their eyesight, their hearing and smell? And do they rely on any of these senses more than others? They definitely rely on their sense of smell more. Their eyesight is not that great. And so they're mostly like the hearing and, and smelling. With babies, it's kind of interesting because their eyes don't focus for quite a while. And so you'll see like, <laughs> They see, you know, wandering eyeballs, um, you know, kind of on each side with the pupils and they get, their pupils go so tiny and then, you know, bigger at night. Uh, the two toads are very nocturnal um, animals. And so their eyesight is just not that great, but definitely um, olfactory for sure. Other than a, a name for a mammal, sloth is you know, is a synonym in English for lazy or reluctance to work. So, you know, sloths have a reputation of being slow moving creatures. Uh, in my opinion, though, it wouldn't be accurate to describe them as lazy animals. So how does their uh, diet and metabolism influence their slowness in body movements? Leslie? Okay, so, um, so, 
they're, they're slow, but with a purpose, right? So um, if they want to be fast, they can actually be fast. And it's really, it really boils down to how they want to expend their energy. So the leaves in their diet, um, for let's say a two-toed sloth, they're primarily uh, leaves. And then they'll also add fruit and like seed pods and, and a tiny bit of protein, maybe with like bugs and bark or something in their diet. Um, and the three toes are just strictly um, leaf eaters and maybe like some seed pods. So there's not a whole lot of nutrients that they're getting in. So it's all about conservation of energy. But if there's a threat or something like that that comes along or, you know, massive rainstorm or anything like that, they can go, they can be actually pretty fast. Um, the two toes much more so than the three toes, but um, the two toes can defend themselves. They can swipe with their claws pretty good. Um, and so you have to be ready because people, you know, have, have this image of sloths being so slow, but they're not, <laughs> they're not that slow actually. <laughs> they're only slow when they want to be. One thing, another thing that I've read about, um, that, that surprised me about sloths is their strength. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but can you talk about like their muscle strength and how that might be an adaptation for their survival? I've read they're very strong animals for their size. Right, so they are very strong and, um, you know, they have to maintain their positions of just like hanging in one place for quite a while. So they have different, you know, mechanisms adapted for that. Like the their claws will just clamp onto something and um, the different like organs in their stomach, we like to explain it like they have like sticky tape in between the organs because the organs don't collapse when they're, you know, staying in that position for a long time that they can hold for hours. But they also, you know, are, are moving their whole body weight. And that weight can get um, very heavy at different times of the week because the, they only come out of the tree down to the, to the ground like once a week or once every two weeks to potty. So that weight uh, really builds up and then they have to, you know, be, be carrying that weight around. When we have an adult sloth with an injury like coming into our rescue center, it will take three to four people um, holding the sloth, you know, the, the feet, the hands, because we're talking about, we need to be careful of the claws, we need to be careful of the teeth, because two-toed sloths have, have large canine teeth. They can be fast and they can deliver very nasty bites. So we have people assigned, you know, head person. <laughs> you, you take one arm, I'll take the other arm. And it's amazing how strong they are. Yes. Oh, wow. It, and it, they're also, you know, of course, we think of them as as arboreal animals living in the trees. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, though, what happens if they fall out of a tree? Or, or how resilient or maybe resistant would be a better word are they to injury in those situations? They can take falls from pretty from pretty high. I mean, we've seen it here just with sloths, you know, practicing in, in our trees at the release site as well. So they can take a pretty good fall. I think that um, you know, so long as it's just like the forest floor, right? If they, I mean, if they hit a rock or something like that, then there's going to be problems because there's a lot of weight coming down. Um, but, uh, they can, they can take falls, um, because that happens naturally in the rainforest, you know, a dry branch or a big rainstorm or something like that. And they will fall. And my next question is actually one that, uh, someone from the audience asked as well. Somebody was wondering how long do sloths live? Do we have an idea on that? Yes. So sloths, well, it will depend on what species we're talking about. So the three-toed sloths, they tend to live for about 15 years. Well, the two-toed sloths, uh, they tend to live up to well, between 20 to 25, in captivity 30, even more. Oh, wow. So they can be surprisingly long-lived animals then. Yeah. Right, so I think the latest, the the most recent one that we heard about was a sloth like at 45 years old, I think, in a zoo in Germany, a two-toed Yeah, sloth. yeah, I think so. Yes, uh-huh. So they're living longer in captivity. And and I don't think anybody's actually done a study that <laughs> for that many years, like to really see no. in the wild. But, you know, they, they have so many more... Um, you know, adversaries in the wild that can that can cause the deaths. And one other really fascinating thing of sloth biology that I was reading about this week is uh, 
basically like their their eco their ecosystems to their uh to their own um you know while we humans often don't realize it um and sometimes we don't even want to think about it we are like ecosystems inhabited by a multitude of creatures and it's the same for sloths especially their fur from what i've read so how is sloth fur like an ecosystem and can you talk about some of the organisms that might live on them yes so um sloths are really incredible um, regarding like that and of course other aspects, but um, they grow um, a specific type of algae that you will only find as lots. Um, and they also have moths that live in their fur. Um, we've seen in the microscope how the hair is pretty much designed to hold this algae both on and in the hair. It is a symbiotic relationship where apparently some studies are, are throwing or are showing us that the stars can get some nitrogen out of this symbiotic relationship between the algae and the moths, sorry, and the, and the moths. So yes, and there are some people that claim, and I've heard of this, obviously this needs to be more researched and, and studied, um, but there are some people that claim that some of the algae uh, can have some uh, positive impacts for for people that might be sick um and so people consider them kind of like the drugstore if you will the pharmacy of the of the forest um but in terms of ecosystem they have a, a truly an, an amazing ecosystem within themselves on their fur and in, even inside of them as well on have some with their digestion mm -hmm. well, i think there's a lot when, more to uh, discover about the natural history of these animals sorry leslie please go ahead um, I was just going to give you an example of when sloths come in to, um, to, to the rescue center, the, the moths that are on them, uh, there's many more on three toads than two toads for some reason. But, and there's different types, like Daniel was saying, different types of moths. And I have a friend that's wanting to study them. And so he, he sent me, you know, this text months ago. If you ever get some sloth moths, <laughs> you know, call me. <laughs> and so, so there I was around the sloth with this little container, you know, trying to catch these, these little moths that are just going in and out of the fur everywhere. But the weird thing is, is that within like two days, they're gone. Like we have no idea where they go, but they're just gone. And so it's kind of like the moth and, and even like the ticks that are on them and the beetles and all those things, like they all clear out. So it's kind of like the bugs know that something's changed and that sloth is no longer like in the forest and they leave. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, some, some bizarre thing that happens, but after like two days, you won't find any of the moths on them. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, to a follow-up question to that, do, does the algae eventually disappear in captive sloths, or is that something that you still see? Because some of your sloths are exposed to the elements, um, from what I've read about your, your center. Yeah, it takes a long time. I mean, it doesn't really ever disappear because it just sort of stays in the crevices that they have within their hair. And so it won't be like, maybe not so bright green, <laughs> but um, definitely dull, you know, a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, I, I, uh, I hope we yeah, discover more about that, those processes. I think that's a really interesting aspect of, of their biology overall. Uh, and Leslie, you were mentioning about, of course, you know, taking, uh, you know, sloths into your care. Um, so for in a, the next part of our conversation, I do want to transition into like sloth rescue and rehab and rewilding efforts that you that you do there. Um, so how did you get started in wildlife rehab? So um, by, tr by, by schooling, I'm an occupational therapist. And so I worked for many years in, in the healthcare field as, a, as an occupational therapist. So that's a lot of rehab work there, but with people. <laughs> so now I just say I'm an occupational therapist with animals instead of people, because I switched. But um, from an early age, I grew up here in Costa Rica and um, I lived here from seven to 15 years old. And we, my dad was putting in a project on the West Coast, which was um, very undeveloped at the time. And so I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere um, at Playa Nosada. And there they were putting in, you know, roads and wells and electricity. And so they would find animals on occasion and they knew that, you know, our family loved them. And so they would just show up and bring us, you know, baby animals or an injured animal. And so um, my parents and, and my brother and sister and I would, you know, take care of them and then 
just let them go because <laughs> we were in the middle of the forest anyway. Um, and so that's how I grew up, uh, you know, being very familiar with the Costa Rican animals. But like Daniel was saying, that was on the West Coast. So there actually weren't that many sloths there. So I grew up with, you know, monkeys and raccoons and parrots and macaws and all of that kind of stuff. But um, there's more sloths like in the uh, Caribbean side and on the um, Southern Pacific. So I really didn't have um, that much experience with sloths. So um, it started as a very early age and then end up doing occupational therapy for many years and then switching back to my first love, which was the animals. And how has your organization's work evolved since Toucan Rescue Ranch was established? <laughs> we, uh, we have grown tremendously. Uh, it's, I, was, I was saying earlier today, they, I was um, being interviewed just for a thing that we're doing here locally. And, and I said, you know, with each animal that came in, it's something different had to grow. So when I said, you know, on the phone and they called me for the first owl, and I was like, I don't know anything about owls. <laughs> you know, I knew about toucans and I knew about parrots and things, but I didn't know anything about raptors, you know, except the fact that they eat meat and I'm a vegetarian and I really didn't <laughs> want to be involved with all that stuff of feeding, you know, having to feed live mice. But, um, you know, you get over it. Um, but, but then with me just accepting, you know, like, oh, sure, I'll take the owl. You know, then it's like, oh, okay, now that owl's, recovered now we have to see can that owl hunt to get him back into the wild so in order to see whether he can hunt we have to build this gigantic um flight cage you know with the whole bottom um with metal all the way down underground so that our live food can't escape and and then put up cameras to see whether the owl's actually hunting or not um so it gets complicated so with these species that came in you know, we're doing what's needed for that animal, especially with like like our sloth program now. And um, and so we've grown um, tremendously. We have the, uh, here in Aradia, we have um, just a, our, our land is like two acres. Uh, that's our main center. And then we have um, a much larger property, um, two properties actually in Sada Piki, which is an hour from here, which is where our release site is. And we have another clinic and whole kind of rescue center set up there as well. So that property is um, um, eight, eight, I think it's eight acres, um, but it's it's quite so, um, so. So we've grown in the sense that, you know, we went from having maybe 20 birds to 50 birds to 100 birds. And then when the mammals started coming in, there's, you know, everything for the mammals. And so now between the two sites, we're averaging 250 to 300 animals that we're managing at any time. Wow. And, that, and you also have um, many sloths as well. Uh, and of course, that's, you know, the focus of our, of our sloth TV on explore.org. Uh, so my next question is about those animals specifically. What sort of injuries or accidents or trauma do sloths experience that they would need your help? So maybe in other words, why do you have to care for and rehab sloths at all? Well, there are three main. Yeah. Yeah. So there are three main reasons why we receive the sloths. Um, so the most common uh, reason is electrocution. So they get electrocuted from, from the power lines. Keep in mind that in Costa Rica, most of power lines are up in utility poles and they're not on the ground. Um, and then the other is that they get hit by cars and they also um, when they cross roads. They um, sometimes they can get attacked by dogs. And in some rare occasions, we do get um, sloths that they were that they belong to the animal black market trade, but thankfully that's not as common as for the other reasons. So when we had to deal with um, electrocuted sloths, we're talking about extreme um, medical cases where it's just really like a burn patient. Um, we're dealing with all kinds of wound care. We've partnered up with um, people here in Costa Rica and in the United States that have sent us um, 
we'll hear from Costa Rica, the tilapia skin um, that they use for burns. And I had seen it years ago with the um, California wildfires and on the bears, they were using tilapia skin on the paws. And I had seen that on Facebook and I was like, wow, <laughs> we gotta figure out, you know, how to get that here because we've got lots of tilapia in Costa Rica. And sure enough, um, a lady that we were working with for um, stem cells, um, she, um, to all the, um, the mixture that they put underneath it to maintain the moisture for the wounds. And so we, we've just, our medical program has grown, you know, exponentially with the care that we're using for these injured, um, victims, especially the electrocutions, which is so painful. And, um, and so we're really trying to alleviate, you know, lots of, you know, it's from a medical case, there's you know, just so much that, that we're dealing with. We're also dealing with sloths that, you know, are very slow for everything. So even <laughs> healing <laughs> is slow. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that it can take a long time to, to rehab a sloth and many months of care. And um, we also have some folks that send us um, collagen, uh, packets from the states for for wound care as well and so it's amazing um it's amazing how advanced that now that we are uh with the topic of um burns and um dog bites and we do all of our own surgeries here we have a very small clinic but i always say that it, it's the it's the best equipped uh, clinic in costa rica because uh, we do all of our own surgeries here we do um, our parasite testing here we um do um you know microscope testing we have little kits that test for bacteria so um bacterial infections and antibiotics, I should say. So uh, we, it's amazing our, our, our medical component, which, you know, has had to just get better and better and better. And, and um, we did a CAT scan on a baby sloth two days ago. Um, so it was, it's amazing <laughs> that we, that we, that we traveled to, to another um, veterinarian, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was pretty amazing to see everything that we can uh, do nowadays. And, it, you know, along with um, caring for and rehabbing, um, you know, injured adult sloths, you also have orphan sloths within your care. Uh, I was wondering about, um, you know, how long a sloth might remain with its mother. And, and do you try to mimic that with uh, young sloths as they're guided towards independence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so usually they will stay with the mother for about a year, a year, well, a year and a half to two years. That's actually how it takes our rehab process. They need to go through different stages that we like to call preschool, elementary, high school, university. The university is our rewarding site. Um, and what we do is that we use, as you can see right now, you can, uh, we use the syringes with the miracle nipples. So that way it's easier for the sloth um, to, to drink that milk from. We also put them in structures, especially when they get to stop elementary, when they're able to climb. We put a lot of leaves and flowers in different levels. So we encourage them uh, to climb. Um, in there you can see uh, them going on ropes. So we use a lot of ropes to simulate the vines. And then finally, when they get to the release site, um, they're more outside um, and they're in massive enclosures with trees inside and they will let them uh, go out. So they come in, they go out, they come in, they go out, and we track them with tracking colors. Um, and thanks to that, it's our success rate is up to like 90, 95%. Um, but yes, we try to simulate as much as we can, all that process when they stay with them. And you might have talked a little bit about this, um, you know, with your with your previous answer. Um, so, but I, I'm still a little bit curious about uh, how you guide sloths through their education. You know, starting with what you called sloth preschool, going up to sloth university, and how do you determine whether a sloth or other rescued animal is a good candidate for uh, rewilding? Yeah. So um, it would depend, of course. Well, Leslie, I don't know if you wanna. Yeah. I was just going to start with the baby and then you can carry on with the older part. <laughs> but yeah. this is a new so for us, we have the preschool. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see if we can 
I don't know if you can see this, but so this is a guarumo leaf or cecropia. It's the three-toed sloth favorite. We know from observing them in the wild with their moms that the sloths will eat little pieces of leaf off of the mom's mouth, and that's how they'll learn what leaves um, to be eating once they're back in the wild. You can see that he is uh, very tiny. I say he, but we don't actually know whether it's a he or she until it'll be a year old. Um, but today was the first day that I gave him the leaf and he's eaten all of this in just a, uh, like, you know, 10 minutes or so, which for a sloth, that's pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. And he really enjoyed it. So from this early age, we're introducing the different types of food that they're going to find in the wild and getting them used to eating that along with the milk. And then now uh, you can take it over, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> yes. So that was part of the, the South Elementary. Then they graduate to, well, no, sorry, that was preschool. And then they go to elementary where we take over. And I mean, we, the, the other part of the start team kind of, um, so is the vets and start rehabbers like myself. Um, and we have him in this structure, like I said. Now, um, what type of criteria we use is going to be their age. It's going to be how much they weight, if they're aggressive to us or not. Um, if they're really feisty, that's a good um, sign. If they're really used to us or domesticated, um, how often they're going to the bathroom, if they go to the bathroom by themselves or not. Um, because obviously at first we need to encourage them to go. Um, and we do that by putting them on, on, on a tree and we gather a little bit of, of poop and pee of another sloth and we put them around their noses and that's how they know, okay, it's time. Um, but then they start to, to do that by themselves. So that's one of the criteria. Um, and then pretty much find the food on their own. That's another, another thing that, that, that we use. If they meet all these criteria uh, or kind of like requirements, then yes, they are, they, we, we send them to, to, to every wild and type. And a, a sort of a related question to this, especially Leslie, since you're showing a sloth in a basket, somebody, that was the first question that we had submitted by our audience. And this is something I was wondering as well. Why are uh, the very young sloths kept in baskets? Can you talk about about that yes yeah, yes good. definitely um so they would be on their mom's belly um and very close in terms of keeping warm and and heating so they don't really re um, they can't regulate their body temperature that well and so here's yeah here's one this is one that um she showed up last night we were, it made my night we were so excited this is a sloth that we released two years ago you can see that she has the collar on, that's her tracking collar, and she's missing an arm. Her name is Socorro, and she had been hit by a car and had damaged you know, her arm so severely that we had to amputate it. And she came back with that little bundle of joy. But that's how the sloths would be on their uh, moms for this whole time, for up to a year and a half, um, close on her, and then they'll wander off in the tree a little bit and come back as they get older. So we're trying to maintain that sense of being close, being wrapped up um, by mother. And we also have um, these heating discs that um, stay warm for up to six hours at a time that in the bottom of the buckets to keep them nice and toasty warm. So the heating um, aspect and keeping them warm is super important for their digestion. And if you have a baby that's you know gotten cold for some reason, we can't feed them until they warm up because we want the digestion. And as soon as they get cold, systems start shutting down. So, um, so that's one of the reasons for keeping them in um, the buckets. But then as you can also see in the video, uh, we have some ones that are a little bit older than these tiny. These ones are almost all like little premature babies. We have some of the little older ones that you suck going along the rope or hanging upside down and like muck fighting and stuff. From there, they'll branch out. Yeah, like those. Um, they have ropes and they have the baskets where they can grab onto everything and they're starting to, um, you know, be normal sloths, uh, wander around. We like to introduce them to the ropes as well because we have rope bridges 
um, for the wildlife at, um, at our release site. And there's rope bridges throughout Costa Rica um, and different parts of the country for wildlife, like to cross highways and stuff. So we want them to get used to crossing on a rope as well and know that the rope is an okay, um, you know, thing to be holding on to, as well as ropes that go from like their enclosures out to the forest and back. And so, um, so then the, the ones that, you know, these guys are all like um, 400 grams or so. The ones that are, you know, 500 and 600 grams, that's when they start venturing out and then going back to their little safe spot. And we, I still have a few more questions for you before we try to get to a few audience uh, questions. Um, but one, I think, really important question is what should somebody do if they find, let's say, an injured animal or, or a baby animal? Do you have any advice uh, for people who might care or, you know, look at that animal and say, hey, that, that animal might need help? Or how would somebody evaluate whether or not an animal in the wild needs help? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so um, oh, go ahead. Sorry? Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, so the first thing uh, to do in that case is call the ne the nearest uh, rescue center for the wildlife we already have. Um, it's always better to call them ahead um, and we're there to help. Uh, if you're in the, in the United States, easily you could just go on Google and type wildlife rehabbers near, near me, and then you're going to find a list. Um, so you can call them, they're going to give you advice. Sometimes, just to give you an example, we receive cases where we call missed rescues. So that happens when an animal, an animal gets rescued or get rescued with all good intention, but um, there's not a good reason to rescue it. For example, baby owls or chicks of owls that they nest on the ground so people find them and they're like, oh my God, they're injured. And then they bring them to us. But the best thing to do is to just let, let them be unless there's a predator like a dog or a cat that might attack it. Um, but yeah, our advice is always just to call your wildlife rehabber or rescue center and they're going to guide you to what to do in, in, that, in that case. Because obviously it will depend on what animal you're dealing with, right? So if you're dealing with a raccoon, it's completely different from dealing with a sunbird. Um, so yeah. <laughs> And how can somebody help your organization as well as the animal, the welfare of animals in, in Central America in general? There's so, so many ways. Um, helping Costa Rica wildlife and, and even the species that you can find in here, it's as easy as to just do your research before you go somewhere where they have animals. So if you go to a, a so-called rescue center or a zoo or a sanctuary, um, try to stay aware of those red flags. For example, if they let you touch an animal, it's usually not a good, like a, a good sign. Um, the animals that get stressed really easily and they also can get domesticated or imprinted into humans. In the case with the sloths, they're always smiling. They have that permanent smile, that permanent smile which is of course adorable. But even when they're aggressive or when they're stressed, they'll be smiling. Um, selfies, for example, taking a selfie with an animal is not a good idea. Uh, it can promote people to have them as pets. So um, please just have the what we know as normal pets, like a dog or like a cat. Um, Stars are not really good as pets. Reptiles are not good as pets. Um, and by us having them or having a wildlife as a pet, so that we can encourage and we can promote. Um, and drive the, the animal black market trade. Uh, by the way, it's, it's the second that moves more illegal money just behind the narco traffic or the drug dealer. Um, and just create awareness. Just tell your friends and family uh, about Chikorosk Ranch, about the slots. And um, for example, if you ever encounter yourself with, um, uh, with a sloth or, or a sloth crossing the road, be patient, let it cross. <laughs> Unless there's a truck coming or something like that, uh, do not have contact with them. Well, there's a, um, you know, there's a, that's really some great advice. Um, uh, one more question that I have for you, though, is I want to know from both of you, what do you enjoy most about your work? Leslie? <laughs> um, well, I, I think 
like the picture that we showed you of the sloth coming in last night with her baby. I mean, that's just like the ultimate, right? The satisfaction of knowing that um, that the program's working, and we have had that, you know, with uh, lots of different species where you know we know that it's been a, a really successful release, and so it's very exciting to be, you know, at the forefront of the medical stuff that we're doing. Um, but also, you know, know that we are getting animals back into the wild and we are doing the education, you know, with the communities and things like that to keep the animals in the wild. And so um, and that sense is very satisfying, you know, the day to day, um, the day to day long hours with these babies and being up all night is exhausting. <laughs> but every time I go to like the release site or they send me pictures saying, hey, look who's, you know, look who showed up today or something like that. Or I wander around and, you know, see who's who's hanging around at the release site. Um, it just uh, it makes it, you know, all worth it, all worthwhile. Yeah, well, in, in my case, um, as the education coordinator, when we educate the children and we see the results. Um, sometimes like we get children that come here or come to the ranch with a different perspective to think that having an animal as a pet is totally okay. Or um, that, yeah, like touching an animal is completely fine, even without all, uh, adults that come on, on our educational walks. And then after that, just seeing them and knowing that touching an animal is not okay. Or then we hear three months after that, um, some kids they probably did some lemonade on on the neighborhood and they got a hundred dollars and because of that pretty much all all the neighbors now they know about the importance of the rainforest and also i work um well at least as an, as an intern um as a slapper meditator and we get cases where it's, it's obviously really really hard to see um the slots that gets really late executed and two probably six months after that when they finally make it with the artwork uh, from everyone and from the donation and seeing them being released. Just like Leslie said, you go to the release site and you see these, uh, these animals that, that we took care of. Um, it's just one of the most satisfying um, things that, that I, I personally can experience. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for your work. I know, um, you know, the audience, um, the, our new audience, the sloths on Explored.org has certainly appreciated it. Uh, since we launched the camera uh, recently. And we have a, a ton of questions from the audience, maybe about as many that I asked you. And um, I know that's a lot. We don't have time for it right now, but we'll, um, if you want, we can uh, stick around and maybe try to get to a few of those. Sure. Yeah, that's okay with me. All right. I, we, we talked a little bit about this um, earlier in the broadcast. Um, uh, you can you just uh, you know reiterate how long uh, sloths live in in the wild? Yes. So in the wild, the two finger sloths they can live up to twenty five years, and the three finger sloths or the three toe sloths they can live for up to fifteen years. And there's also something mentioned earlier in the broadcast too about like the senses of sloths, um, in particular like how baby sloths you know might uh, have a hard time adjusting to light and dark colors, for instance. Uh, so what does the world look like for, uh, for a baby sloth? Do we, can we kind of imagine what that is or, do we, or can we surmise what they might be experiencing at a very young age? I, I mean, I, I think that in terms of vision, uh, that it's very probably blurry. Um, they definitely uh, will pick up their noses and sniff. They know, um, well, there he is, <laughs> um, sniffing. And by sounds and by, and they recognize voices. The, the voices, for sure, they recognize um, this, the scents they, they recognize. Um, but I think in terms of vision, it's probably a little blurry. And I asked about the baskets earlier, but uh, somebody was wondering, had um, a different question about the baskets. What might prevent um, a sloth from climbing out of the baskets that you that you put them in and, and maybe just leaving that area where where they are? <laughs> um, yeah, nothing's to prevent them. They can go climbing whenever, whenever they want. That's, that's, uh, that's up to them. Um, well, if it's cool outside, you know, we will go by and like, you know, tuck them in a little bit. Um, but this is a nice one because that's a normal basket, you know, that has the edge and he's an older baby. Uh, and so he's really practicing now doing, you know, chin ups, 
Um, so that all of that's just great work for him to develop his muscles and his curiosity. Uh, so no, we encourage them to climb out and back in their, their little buckets and that's, that's fine with us. And do they have any um, natural predators or enemies in, in the wild? Yes, they do. Um, so probably 10 years ago, um, it used to be the harpy eagle, that is the biggest eagle in the, in the world, but now it's believed to be locally extinct. So now it's the ocelot. Um, of course, among other, other animals, uh, so we have uh, the ocelots, you have snakes, especially with baby sloths, um, and of course owls and the raptors. It doesn't happen that often. Um, we need to consider that sloths are not really high in calories. So for an animal getting into a fight, at least with a, with a two-toed uh, sloth, is not worth it sometimes. But yeah, they do have predators. Mm -hmm. And how many offspring can they have at, at one time? So, so they, they usually have, have one. Yeah, go ahead, Leslie. No, no, uh, they usually just have one. Um, but there are cases of twins. Uh, a lot of the times, one of the twins will be like the healthier of the two, and that's the one that will make it. Um, but there, there have been cases of moms uh, raising twins. Uh, not that often, though. It's usually just one. And you do have many individual sloths at your center. Um, somebody was wondering if you could tell us about some of the different personality traits that you've observed in sloths. Maybe some of the animals that you are caring for right now, and maybe some that you've um, cared for in the past and are now living it up in, in the wild. I think that for Leslie, uh, you and I can answer. Uh, so, well, in, in, my, in my experience, when I, when I started, we had uh, one that you say, um, I completely forgot. Um, Kronos. And Kronos, he was, he, his personality was incredible. He is so active. He tried to escape every single time they had an opportunity. We had this big buckets full of leaves. And at the time, we had six slots on the structure. And sometimes we'll go in there and we only find five on the structure. We just dig on the, on the leaves. And then there he was just eating in the, in, in the bucket full of leaves. Um, so they do have the personalities that we have on. I was a bit more kind of chill, and, but unless you can tell more, more about the personalities of the, of the, of the new ones. <laughs> right, so um, they do have different personalities and um, it's, it's interesting because sloths are, are more solitary in nature. So the reason why um, as tiny babies, we will put them together like we have a couple um, pairs right now is for that comfort and for the stimulation for them, um, as you can see here. Um, and so, um, but it is introduced, <laughs> as you can see, <laughs> hey, um, you know, I, wanna, I want some milk. Um, they, will, they will compete like that as well. Um, they'll do their mock fighting and they'll be like, you know, some of them are more feisty than others or um, they'll, you know, uh, try to go like this, you know, with their claws and, um, and, and get each other or, you know, stab each other in the eye with their nails or something. <laughs> but, um, but they do play, they do play and they do interact with each other at this age because they would have that interaction with their mom. Um, the, you know, a very close relationship with their mom. So, um, so you do see different personalities in sloths, even though they're solitary by nature. And, uh, you know, of course, you're in close contact with the sloths. Um, you know, disease has been something that's been on the minds of probably every human in the world um, almost every day for the past couple of years, uh, unfortunately. So somebody was wondering about, are sloths vulnerable to picking up diseases from human caretakers or vice versa? Could you catch um, an infectious disease from a sloth? Yes, so um, there are certainly zoonotic things that, that, that can go back and forth not too many from humans to sloths um, that I know of, but uh, definitely we have sloths that have horrible bacterial infections. Um, and so we have to be very careful around those sloths. And we also have sloths that have uh, horrible parasite problems that come in um, from the wild, just full of parasites. And so, um, so we do um, take precautions in those cases. 
the, with um, the little ones, they can still come with um, parasites as well. And so one of the habits that we do, you know, you've all been heard of hand washing, but hand washing in between each baby is like super important because we don't want to be passing things, you know, between the babies or, or for us. And so um, we will glove up um, quite frequently, but also um, hand washing is super important. And one final question I have um, is, and this this is something that I could I could not answer um, because uh, my knowledge of, of Spanish is <laughs> limited to very few words. Um, but I'm wondering what the, uh, somebody is wondering what's the the Spanish word for sloth. Oh, oh. You, we were, we were going to bring that up. We were just talking about it. We were asking earlier. Go ahead, Daniel. It's kind of funny. Yeah. So um, sloth in Spanish is actually oso perezoso. So oso means bear and perezoso means lazy. So the translation would be lazy bear. But as we have talked about, first of all, they're not lazy. They're just energy efficient and they're not bears. Also, the animals that they are mostly related to are armadillos and anteaters. And anteaters in Spanish is oso or miguel, or like ants, bear. But we don't have, and just like Leslie and I, we, we were talking before, I don't know what's wrong or I don't know what's, what's with us with, uh, with, uh, with bears, but we name a lot of things bears are not bears, and we don't have bears in Costa Rica. So yeah, lazy. We don't have bears. So, yeah, so we just make <laughs> them up. Um, I've got to grab my cord really quick, so I'll be right back. <laughs> Well, that actually was um, my my final question uh, for everybody. It's been a, it's been a really fun conversation, um, Daniel and Leslie. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yes, just 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 to encourage everyone to uh, to join on the Explore uh, camera. We're pretty much always there answering questions. Uh, so if you got any more questions that you didn't get the chance to uh, to ask today, we're right there. We're always checking, um, and we we always live unless something something already happens. So yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun, and it's been so much fun to see the pictures that people are taking and posting, and of course the funny things that happen. We had two of those babies that were on the basket were holding on to each other the other day, and one was holding on by one foot, ready to just drop. <laughs> and I went in there and caught them just in time, and somebody was right there writing, "Hey, great save!" And I was just like, "Yeah!" <laughs> um, it was really, it was really kind of funny to see. Um, how you know excited people are, and we're we're just so excited to be sharing with you and and letting you experience a little bit of what it is to be like here at the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica. Well, thanks so much once again. Uh, my guests today were Leslie Howell and Daniel Quintanilla Mendoza from the Toucan Rescue Ranch in Costa Rica. If you want to learn more about their work, you can go to their website. A lot of great info on there. It's toucanrescueranch.org. And of course, you can watch the sloths uh, on Sloth TV on Explored.org. So please check that out. And my name is Mike Fitz with Explored.org. Thanks for joining us today and have a great evening.